Welcome. This is uh, our next panel. Our topic is encouraging innovation in healthcare distribution and product development. My name is Richard Corcoran. I'm a representative from District 37. And with us today are Dr. Michael Perry. He's the medical director for the Laser Spine Institute. Rose Naff, who's the chief executive officer for Florida Health Choices. Holly Plug, who's the vice president of CGI Government Markets, who's set up the federal exchange. And Jonathan Anderson, the vice president of sales and strategy distribution integration for employer markets and with the uh, Florida Blues. And we'll get right away started. Uh, if you guys would like to introduce yourselves, give us a little bit more background if you'd like, and, and go right into from your introduction where healthcare should be headed for the state of Florida in terms of innovation or products. Dr. Perry? All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, AIF for putting on this uh, forum. I think this is excellent. I think it's uh, um, to get all the uh, stakeholders uh, all in one room, or most of them, and having discussions regarding uh, health care in the future, I think it's important. And maybe uh, when this uh, talk is over, maybe we'll be able to uh, have some answers to some key questions that are asked. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Perry, a board-certified internal medicine physician. I did my residency in Hartford, Connecticut, Mount Sinai Hospital, and I'm the medical director at Laser Spine Institute. Um, Laser Spine Institute was founded in uh, 2005 by myself, Dr. James St. Louis, Dr. Glenn Hamburg. Uh, we set out with the goal of developing and uh, implementing the most innovative uh, care and spine treatment. Uh, we started with nine employees and three physicians. We presently have over 600 employees and over 25 physicians. Um, we have four facilities throughout the U.S. We have our main office here in Tampa. We have a facility in Scottsdale, uh, one in Philadelphia, and one in Oklahoma City. Um, as medical director at Laser Spine Institute, I basically oversee the uh, the medical operations and ensure medical compliance on a corporate level. Uh, and I oversee the medical uh, research department, which we just formed, uh, because as we've talked about here in the panels previously, I think it's important that we have outcome studies uh, that show uh, what medicine is good for what types of pathology. And, and I think that's a big issue that will need to come into play when we're looking at cost and containments regarding healthcare in uh, Florida and the U.S. Uh, some of the big issues that I see as far as uh, coming down the pike from the Obamacare and, and the initiatives that are started, uh, I can foresee a, sh a significant shortage in primary care physicians. Um, one of the issues that also I have concern about being a physician is the collaborations that we have between physicians, hospitals, uh, third-party payers, and the government. I think that's a big issue that we need to, to uh, take control of and, and get answers to. Uh, so those are just a few. I could go on for a few hours if you like, but no, I'll pass it on. Uh, thank you, Rose Naff, um, CEO of Florida Health Choices. Um, Health Choices is, uh, we're building Florida's insurance marketplace. We um, are currently enrolling agents. We have about 150 agents that are actively enrolled um, in the marketplace and are going through their training right now. We are onboarding vendors, over 40 um, health plans offered statewide will be available um, very soon. We will be moving to end-to-end um, -end testing um, the last week in January with a go-live date for uh, small group uh, products in, in February, and I'm um, looking forward to doing that. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to fathom what some of our innovations really are. There are things that really shouldn't be innovations, but since they're, they haven't been in use in Florida before, we're actually going to have a single standardized form for people to enroll in insurance. Uh, doesn't sound that innovative, but... It's new and it's, it's been needed for a long time. We'll be offering side-by-side um, -side comparison of products. Um, there'll be a, a, one of my favorite um, components is a out-of-pocket calculator. So when someone is comparing an HMO product to a, uh, a maybe a high, um, high deductible product, they can actually calculate the real impact of that on their family. So um, we're, we're continuing to move towards bringing that to um, Florida small businesses. Holly? Good morning and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate today. Uh, CGI is building the federally facilitated exchange uh, and also uh, six state-based exchanges. And what's really important about being here for me is to understand you know, not all states are the same and the issues are different. Um, some of them may be nuanced, but they really are different. And it's interesting, I've, I've loved being here to hear uh, the entire ecosystem uh, and the issues that uh, are being 
that, that are, are, you all are facing and how we can support you because we are your partner. And there's a lot of decisions that are going to have to be made by the legislature and the, and the administration uh, coming up in the next couple of months. So uh, one of the things we wanted to offer in collaboration is to help, you know, to facilitate your decision-making process. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I think we have learned a lot. We'd like to share as much of that with you as possible so that, you know, you can learn from, this is all new. So it's not very much experience that anybody has, but for those experiences that do exist, and you know, I would like to share them and help uh, ease the, or at least provide the pros and cons of the different approaches so that you can make the best decisions, you know, based on the information available. Thank you. Jonathan? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, being here today and look forward to, you know, some very positive dialogue. Where did everybody go? Did they, is this like, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I'm with uh, Florida Blue, uh, formerly Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. We've uh, made a branding change, and as you've seen, uh, from a commercial perspective as well as uh, out in the field, uh, we're having great success from that. Uh, Florida Blue actually represents over 4 million uh, Floridians. Uh, we uh, represent over 30,000 employer groups that actually buy their benefits um, throughout the state of Florida. Uh, as, as well as we've uh, worked on some interesting in the past 10 years diversification strategy. And the diversification strategy has created some different joint ventures with uh, different technology companies. Some of you may have heard of Availity, uh, which has become one of the top five uh, claims adjudication um, transaction companies in the country, uh, which is a partnership with uh, Humana. Uh, we've also um, ventured out into uh, workers' comp as part of our diversification strategy. Uh, we've moved into uh, pharmacy benefit management as well as ancillary. Uh, and uh, we've also purchased some different um, staff model HMOs, uh, capital health plan. We have a 51% ownership in there as well as Florida health care plan, which is over in the Volusia, Flagler County uh, area. The recent transaction that we made was a uh, um, diagnostic clinic. Um, which some of you may or may not heard of. So we're getting a little innovative and creative as far as how we help Floridians attain affordable health care. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, last year, our total premium uh, equated to about $8.3 billion. Uh, we're also one of the top employer groups in the state of Florida. We employ over 6,500 employees um, that support uh, Florida and, uh, and our economic growth. Uh, from a... Uh, mission and vision standpoint. Uh, our current CEO, Pat Garrity, has just changed our, our the board approved a, a change of the mission and vision, which is very positive. It's, it's like uh, a few words, uh, not a whole paragraph as it was before, uh, but we're very focused on really helping people and communities achieve better health as far as our mission goes. And from a vision perspective, uh, you know, to be a leading innovator enabling health, healthy communities, uh, very focused on Florida, very focused on productivity and the quality of life of Floridians, um, which really encompasses, you know, the, uh, the culture of the organization. Um, my personal background, uh, I spent uh, 20 years in the sales side of the business. Um, I've currently uh, taken on, I've worked for publicly traded companies um, and been the VP of sales for those organizations. Now I've been uh, instructed uh, to handle the strategy operations for Florida Blue. And so if anybody wants to help take health care reform um, and 90% of Florida Blue, our membership is in the employer market space today, uh, 30,000 employers and over 4 million members figure out how to transform the organization through health care reform and come up with a new business model. Um, be glad to hear your ideas uh, because that is the, uh, the task at hand. Um, and once we, went, uh, I was taking over the task four months ago, uh, we've interviewed over 200 different healthcare CEOs, uh, hospital CEOs, consultants, including KPMG, Booz, Accenture. We've talked to clients, we've talked to chambers throughout the state of Florida uh, to make sure that we understand and they understand what the potential opportunity is uh, with healthcare reform uh, impacting their business, not just you know, now, but what is it going to look like in the future with these innovative opportunities 
uh, as well as these new products and services that we need to provide Floridians. So exciting time. Um, glad to be here and appreciate the, the time. Let's uh, start with a somewhat, since we have a panel of experts in this regard, in terms of exchanges, uh, I'll start with you, Holly. Um, do we, uh, what, what would your recommendation be? Have an exchange, uh, default to the federal exchange, uh, and if so, why? Uh, you know, if we were here last year at this time, I would have a, a, an answer for you that said I would, I would uh, politics aside, elections aside, and all of that, that uh, a state-based exchange would, would be the best answer for Florida. Uh, because you would have more control over the plans, the brokers, uh, the interaction with the citizens. Uh, but now we are here a year later. And uh, since the date doesn't seem like it's going to move, and it's October 1st, 2013, when open enrollment begins, I think that that, that is probably foreclosed at this point. Uh, so I don't know that you have that choice before you, because I don't think everybody could get ready by then. Too many decisions would have had to have already been made. Uh, so now I think the, 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 what you do need to decide, February 15th is the date, uh, whether you're going to be, um, there's two models of fully federal exchange, federally facilitated exchange, or the partnership model. And the partnership model allows you to have some control over uh, two areas, plan management, which is uh, what plans would be offered on the exchange and what the products would look like, and uh, the in-person uh, constituent uh, interaction, which I think is very important uh, to have the ability to interact with your citizens in the state as opposed to requiring them to uh, you know, deal with uh, someplace far, far away up north. Jonathan? Um, you know, I, anytime you get a chance to manage your business from a state perspective, I think that's positive. Um, uh, because states should compete on not just the exchange, but their health care costs, you know, their health care premiums, et cetera. Anytime you have 50 states competing for economic development and economic growth, uh, I think the intent, you know, for those states is in the right place to be competitive. Uh, that being said, what, what's very unique about, uh, I would say, the, the, exchange, the exchange environment today um, is you're seeing you know, uh, consulting groups create their own private exchanges. So they could be out of Chicago, it could be out of you know, uh, Atlanta, it could be out of Dallas. And there, is a, there, there will be a competing you know, process for the exchange uh, on the private side of the business, as well as on the public side of the business. Now, what's, what's unique in the, that situation is there's no federal subsidies that go into the private exchange. Okay, so that's a com clear competitive advantage for the public exchange um, to play uh, in the state of Florida. Um, I, I think the challenge right now is really the ability for uh, the state uh, as well as the feds, to be able to effectively execute, um, you know, the exchange by the time frame that's expected, um, which is an unbelievable time frame. So if you look what the, the health plans have done um, in the past 24 months, we've probably spent, you know, $140 million just to be compliant with the law based on your, your product designs, based on the benefit designs based on the mandates, uh, and also to hit the timeframes. So we have spent a tremendous amount of time and energy focused on being compliant for uh, the federal government. And I think that, you know, there, something has to give in your organization as far as what the priorities are. Uh, so, you know, the, the exchange, I think, is, you know, you want to own it, you want to control it, um, but there's a cost involved. And the question is, what's the distribution cost versus the, the distribution outside of it? Let me, uh, Rose, ask you the same question. And you, I mean, you've set up a, a marketplace, obviously, in, in the legislation that's been passed in the recent years. One, one answer to the question, and then two, differentiate between your exchange 
or marketplace and, and the federal or state partnership exchange that we're expected to. Okay. Um, one of the things I would suggest, even if there's a federal exchange, there's a lot of decision making and options for the state. Right now, the state defines small group as up to 50. You could move that up to 100 so that the federal exchange was serving larger groups. There are a lot of decisions to be made. That's just one. Another is whether, whether you're a formal partnership in, under the federal um, options or whether you're just a cooperative state in the, uh, with, when it comes to regulation of the vendors and plans or whether the state wants to be completely hands off and have you know, nothing to do with it. So there's, there's, there's options and decisions even with a federal exchange. Um, there's also um, another model, uh, there's the partnership model, which um, Holly described, but I, there's another one I call, I would call partnership plus, where the state could be a partnership. Um, there's an option in the law, in, in the federal rules, that allow the federal exchange, federally facilitated exchange, to contract with a not-for-profit in the state, and there's no limit on what that component might be. Um, so there, there are opportunities. Now, I know the federally facilitated exchanges, they have their, their work cut out for them. They, the feds really don't want to customize for individual states, but, you know, we are Florida and we're unique and we are important. Um, the differences um, differentiate the marketplace um, from the exchanges. Um, first of all, we predated um, the federal, um, the Affordable Care Act. We purposefully branded ourselves as a marketplace so as not to be confused with an exchange as defined in the Affordable Care Act. Um, we are voluntary. Um, we're, our products offerings are not limited to um, essential health benefits. Uh, we can do contracts for services. We could do chiropractic, you know, 12 chiropractic visits a year. We can do uh, discount medical plans, prepaid health plans. There's a lot of product options to offer in our marketplace. I think most importantly, though, it is voluntary. I mean, a marketplace is where people can go and choose to buy or not to buy without threat of penalty. Uh, and ex the exchanges, as they're defined, uh, do have threat of penalty and um, an implied um, mandate that people do buy, regardless of whether they like. Uh, you know, if you go to the farmer's market, you, you may walk by through the parking lot and decide, you no, know, the vegetables look good today, and you can walk away. It doesn't sound like that's what's intended with an exchange. Dr. Perry? I, I think it's important that the, the, the state of Florida actually has some control over it, but what I'm really concerned about is the cost involved. Uh, the government uh, has uh, uh, stated that they're going to fund so many billions of dollars to each state based on the number of people, uh, but I tried to look back and find out when the last time the federal government actually came up with a number that was accurate, and I think that's going to fall. A big price is going to be uh, falling the, uh, the, uh, the taxpayers here in Florida. Um, so I would actually uh, think that opting out of the federal government uh, exchange program, uh, just based on that, um, but I think it is important that we take some control. And if, if it, there can be some type of shared opportunity there, uh, I think it could be explored, but I think it's either all or none, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but my, my, my vote would definitely be to, to let the federal government take it. And the other, the other problem is with the federal government, they've, they've actually said they'll do it for 10 years and the states take 5% uh, of the actual costs uh, in, in several years from now. Uh, but there's nothing stated after that 10 years. It doesn't say that the government's going to continue to fund you at 90%. You know, and I think that's another issue that needs to be uh, ironed out before you know, any state makes a decision. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, may I add something? Yeah. If, you know, it's the state's decision whether to do an, uh, an exchange, a partnership, or the federal exchange, but if the state ever wants to do its own exchange, the sooner the better. And, and the reason I say that is for, is for, for, for multiple reasons, but the two main reasons are the build is expensive. The Federal government is providing the funds to build right now, and they won't be providing those, or they said they won't be providing those in the future. So if you think about the cost to build, if you're going to recoup that over the life of a, a platform's contract or something like that, and you're using issuer assessments to fund that, it's going to be a higher cost over the long run for our industries. Um, also, the feds have uh, put out a rule that their issuer assessments on the federally facilitated exchanges are going to be, I think, 3.5%. So a little state like Rhode Island, big state like Texas or California, whatever, it, uh, the fees are going to be that much. So in effect, I think the large states 
will be subsidizing the smaller states with that assessment. So our issuers will be subsidizing issuers in, in other states. I think a state our size can do it at a, loss, a lot less expensive um, assessment. And I think the state we, we have, as, as you are the CEO, the state has moved towards creating a marketplace. We do like the concept. And, and you know, the concept as a legislator, when you're listening to it, you're thinking, okay, this sounds vaguely familiar to Apple creates this iPhone, they create a, a software, and anybody can go on and create an application that I can all is available to every single consumer. And the thought that, okay, we could have this exchange that's set up, and any healthcare provider of any type or of any minimal offering can go on there, like you said, chiropractic, go on there, and I could go on there, I could have a price calculator, and I could choose, okay, at this point in time, for me, or as an individual, as a single person, I'm just gonna buy a flu shot, three physicals and a, a, you know, a couple physicals and, uh, and three office appointments. And I can get that for 20 bucks a month. Um, and there's multiple offerings. But, but is that where we are right now with the, with the marketplace? We, we do have the option of, um, we have, really there's no limit, because there's the word other is in the statute, other health products and services. So anything related to health, we can offer in the marketplace. It's about building the technology to support each of those. You wouldn't want, um, uh, on dissimilar products laid down side by side. So you've got to have a tab for, for the different products. It's interesting though too, um, the rules are not complete, but it's clear that the federal, um, that federal agency that's you know, in charge of the state and federal exchanges, they're in the rule there's, there's the word other in there, um, and there seems to be more flexibility with a state-based exchange about what types of products. They have not locked down or narrowly define the products yet, because the word other still is sitting there. So in a state-based exchange, it's quite possible we could offer the broader range of services than I think the federal exchange is contemplating. May I make a statement? Yeah. Uh, I think that's right, and uh, one of the states that we're working with, because one of the issues we didn't, we kind of alluded to is that after, so the feds are uh, providing 100% funding to build the underlying platform. And then uh, in 2015, that switches to the state's responsibility to sustain it. And uh, one of the states that we're working with is doing exactly what Rose was talking about to sustain the cost of, this, of the exchange. They're planning uh, to offer a series of other products. So beyond what is the, you know, the, the base medical plans. Uh, and that way they believe that they're gonna grow their marketplace. Uh, and that, that revenue that will come in for the offering of other products will cover the cost you know, of what are the mandatory uh, uh, product set. In addition though, one of the things you can think about is you don't have to, if, you, if you're going on the federal exchange, you have to go through a complete year because of open enrollment, but you can uh, opt out after that first year and, uh, and build a state exchange, and there is still that 100% funding until 2016 for states that start out on the federal exchange. So that's an option for you as well. And then maybe you'll be mature, you can morph, you can see what works and what doesn't work, and you'll be up and running. So there, there's ways in which to, uh, you know, th that these decisions don't have to be final today. But wouldn't you say that the innovation that's a, that, that our country is so wonderful at in every other area would be stifled by the fact that what we've set up, though, is a central benefits plan, and, and if we're not in that one, then there's a penalty or a tax? I mean, what's driving innovation is a, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways is demand. Correct. You know? and, and when you stifle that demand, aren't you stifling the innovation? Well, that's a minimum. You know, you can, you can go beyond that and then you can create your innovation in that expansion. You can go beyond upwards, but not beyond downwards. That's correct. And I, and I think when you think about the quantity of people who are uninsured, really what, what they really want is downward. Or what they could really even get and benefit from would be downward, no? Take a single guy who's 25 and is uninsured. I just need a, I just need a flu shot and a couple, couple office visits. But that's not gonna be available to me or it technically, even if you had it on an exchange, it's not gonna be available to me because um, there's, there's this threat over my head that, that's gonna be detrimental to me making that choice. 
Yeah, I mean, if I can make a comment, I think um, to your point, I mean, the innovation opportunity in the product development space is, is stifled because uh, you have to be compliant with the federal government benefits we're being offered. So whatever's offered on the exchange, we, have, we offer in the market. Um, so uh, when we look at our portfolio of business, you know, we're, we're asking the, the, the feds or, you know, anybody that will listen to give us a chance to leave our business grandfathered uh, because those benefits have to be changed and modified uh, in order to meet the compliance of, of the law. And the impact of those, uh, those particular groups, which is like a third of our book, uh, will be an increase beyond, you know, the normal increase. Um, and that's where I think, you know, your, your comment on can I buy an additional product or service that I need to be compliant, but I want, I have to, I have to buy a compliant plan that it's at the maximum level that the federal government says is, is compliant. I may now not want that. You know, my brother might be a doctor and can give me care for free. Um, so I don't want that. So I, I do think, you know, the, the boundaries that we're dealing with in the industry today has limited us to an 80% loss ratio on the individual and small group, which says all my medical costs need to go to, you know, the, the, uh, the members, which is, I think, great. 85% uh, loss ratio on the large group. So those are locked in. That's one side of the ditch, right? The di you know, when you keep the, keep the car between the ditch. So, so we've got that side of the road pretty much locked in. The other side is the benefits, and that's locked in too. So you've got the path that you need to go down. The question will be, how can you create strategic partnerships with your delivery system? How can you be innovative on the delivery system side to help lower those costs and bend the cost down? Because anything that goes over 80% or 85% goes back to the member or the employer, which again, those are the facts that we're dealing with. Um, add on top of that, you know, you've got about a $500, between $500 and $600 tax that will be given to every member um, because of health care reform in the next, you know, three years. Some will come off in three years, some won't. But we're, we're working, you know, within a certain parameter um, that we can be created from the health plan side. As we sell a, you know, there could be somebody sitting in this room today that may be comfortable with a $5,000 deductible plan. Um, on a fully insured side, you're not going to get that. It, it won't be sold anymore. And that's innovation where you could buy that, you know, product that you were talking about that's not there. So, so I, I, I do think that we, we are where we are relative to certain components with the law. Um, what, what I'm finding when I travel throughout, you know, the country uh, is a lot, of, a lot of companies are looking at their fully insured premiums and they're saying, I can't afford it now. Um, I'm definitely, you know, it's going to be very difficult to afford it in the future. What are my options today? And that's where innovation comes in uh, relative to the network. You know, what are you willing to, to address relative to a network? Uh, because historically, if you look at our, our business, in the past, you know, 10 years, our uh, GDP, uh, I think, you know, for healthcare is, it hit, over 2 trillion, 2.7 trillion GDP is like 19 or something like that. Everybody's wanted all the product, all the products, all the services, and all the providers, and that sometimes doesn't create efficiency or effectiveness. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, major plays as far as value-based contracting with providers or with delivery system experts uh, to deliver better cost at the end of the day. And I think that's positive. I really do. Um, when you look at the, some of the core root problems that we're facing, it's, it's, it's pretty simple math, right? 55% of the commercial business goes to the, to the delivery system. Um, that's where they generate their revenue. They make 48% of their margin on that commercial business. If a Medicare patient goes into a delivery system, they make 13% below their cost. If a Medicaid patient goes into their system, they make 44% less than their cost. They're losing money. If the uninsured goes in, um, they, they, don't, they, get, they lose 95% of their cost. So they're never getting that money. And that just hit $41 billion in 2011. So you start looking at the implications of health care reform, you'll see Medicaid numbers go from $40 million today to $76 million by 2019. Okay, that you just, you just put a ton of um, individuals into Medicaid in the lowest reimbursement sector other than the uninsured into that bucket. And the Medicare population, you know where it's going. 
and the commercial market, um, you know, less than 100, they'll take a look at the private exchange and figure out what's best for them from a business standpoint. So the businesses will be making, you know, financial decisions. I think they're going to, they'll wait and see what the implications are of the exchange, how effective they are. I think your challenge with the exchange earlier, if it's not up and ready and, ready and running well, the brand reputation of your effectiveness to run an exchange will get out in the market pretty quick mm -hmm. and will we'll slow down the possible uh, you know, um, movement transition towards that. So what are those innovations in delivery? What are the innovations in delivery? Oh, like, what a great question. I appreciate you asking that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, you know, when, when you look at the innovation that we're seeing today, um, you know, companies are starting to create uh, value-based contracting, as I mentioned before. And I saw Mark Labor here, he's with Aetna, they do a great job. Um, you know, there's other companies that do a great job, uh, obviously, in this space. But these are, are very innovative um, contracting to say, you know, we may, we may pay more, we may pay less, but the quality and the readmission rates need to be lowered, okay? So we've, we've gone through and implemented um, particular uh, medical programs relative to congestive heart failure, relative to cancer, um, where we work collaboratively with the providers and the hospital systems. We drive down costs anywhere from 19 to 30 percent, and we drive down admission rates in the same 30, 34, 30 to 40 percent reduction. But that means you need to understand the employer, and you need to understand the member's behavior because they need different solution sets in order to keep them healthy. And the, the, I think the positive thing, again, on the ACA uh, is that it has expedited that relationship to say, well, the current path is unsustainable, and we need to come up with some alternative um, you know, solutions. We're willing to try it now as we move down there. Now, I think the challenge and some of the drawback of that uh, is the fact that the delivery systems um, are, they've increased, they've bought like, uh, there's been a 36% increase in provider acquisitions that the delivery systems are buying these doctors. Um, I was in the last meeting, or last question, there was a gentleman over here about the administration. Most of the, the primary care docs are saying, I just want to practice, you know, get me out, um, and let me just take care of my patients, and somebody else will handle the administration. The challenge with that today is, is as that aggregation occurs, they're charging more, more on their price points, and there's not much delivery systems or health plans can do other than to fiercely try to negotiate to hold the cost down. So, so it's, it's going through this time until we can help them with data analytics to understand their patients, data analytics to help understand uh, access, and data and analytics to understand the quality outcomes, um, we start moving towards that. So, you know, modified networks can actually work pretty well. The challenge has been the consumers don't think that that's positive. If you go to um, different countries, you know, throughout the world, clinics aren't a bad name. In this country, for some reason, if you go to a clinic, people think that that's the negative connotation. It's not true. You can get all your care in one setting, Cleveland Clinic, you know, Mayo Clinic, um, but a lot of people don't look at it that way. So, so the members and consumers have requested um, all the doctors, that's a good health plan to me. You know, if I can go to Mayo Clinic um, or if I can go here or there, that's a good plan because they advertise and they look good um, versus understand the quality. Um, and I could go on, but I don't want to go on. So, let, let me skip to you, Dr. Perry, because I mean, you're a perfect example of the American dream, a great idea, a gift in surgery, um, spawns into this massive uh, delivery of, of uh, health care that wasn't really in the market space beforehand. And you, and you obviously deal heavily in medical devices. I mean, wh where, do you, where do you see where we are right now in terms of the, all the innovation that you guys created and, and now deliver to X thousands of, of patients? Where do you see it heading as a result of, of the Obamacare and, and where we are. Well, I, I think it's important that, that um, with any medical practice or any ACO, any um, accountable care organization, that you have to have uh, outcome studies. You have to have to show that a particular procedure for a particular pathology 
is the, is the least expensive, gets the, the, the patient uh, back to work, back out of their discomforts. And, and I think medicine's gonna have to turn towards that. And I think it's these accountable care organizations, gonna, they're gonna have to make those facts available. And not only that, but the quality of care. I think it's just not quantity, it's quality. Getting these patients back in their home, back to life, things that they want to do that they couldn't do based on a, a, a not a dis disability, but an injury uh, or just degenerative changes. Of, uh, in our case, it's the spine. Um, one of the real issues I have uh, regarding innovation in, uh, in medical technology is the tax, that the medical device tax, which is coming down the pike, which is a 2.3% gross on, ma on uh, device manufacturers. And, 2.3% gross, it is actually pretty gross if you think about it, and maybe it should be a net. Um, I think that's gonna stymie a lot of development. I think a lot of companies are gonna go belly up. I think they're not gonna be able to sustain that. I think larger companies like Medtronics and Johnson & Johnson, they'll be able to, to handle that hit. But I think companies that have a very, very low profit margin, they're not gonna be able to sustain that. And I think not, not only is it gonna stymie innovation, because these smaller companies that may may produce the next, you know, next aspirin, you know, mm -hmm. uh, won't be around uh, because they just they just can't because financially they can't sustain that that hit of 2.3 percent. Uh, the other part of that, and I know there are major uh, uh, medical companies, device manufacturers are actually laying people off, and they've done it over the past couple of years because they knew this was actually coming down the pike, uh, where they start laying people off because they know down the road they're going to hit get hit with this tremendous tax bill. And uh, so now your unemployment goes up. And so now you put people on exchanges or you have to pay unemployment. So I think there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of factors that go, that go innovation. I, again, I think getting the best procedure uh, for the best pathology with the best outcome, uh, once these are shared and uh, well-documented and peer-reviewed journals, I think it's it will only be a matter of time before uh, the public, uh, the general population, will seek these facilities out because they're going to be able to deliver the best care for the lowest cost. Skipping over onto another part of the Affordable Care Act, as a legislator is picking experts' brains, would, would you say expand Medicaid or, or, or not expand Medicaid? Jonathan? Um, you know, for, first of all, I don't know enough about the implications of the cost because I think there's part of equation that says, you know, what's the benefit, what's the cost, and then what's the value. So I, I can't answer the cost question. I can answer from, you know, a personal perspective, and, and that says, listen, there's a safety net that needs to be sustained, not just in Florida, but in this country. You have to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Now, how you define that, um, I don't know, you know, if that's potentially the federal poverty level. That's not my decision to make. Um, but I, uh, but I do believe, you know, we, we, there's a better, you know, there are better ways to take care of folks and communities. Um, I do believe that we've gotten uh, too far away from the federal government trying to take care of everybody, or the state government. It needs to be, you know, local community engagement to take care of people. Working, you know, that's where healthcare is delivered in the community. It's not delivered in Tallahassee. It's not delivered in, you know, Washington. It's delivered in the community. So the community should be really, in my opinion, in charge of the dollars to be the most efficient and effective delivery system and have them compete by city, okay, and compete for those jobs that they want to bring in from other states. And then you create a multifaceted city competition for healthcare and you create, you know, um, states competing for healthcare and you hold your legislators accountable for, for that. And I think that gets everybody pulling the rope in the same spot you know, in the same direction. Um, and that makes sense to me. Um, you know, taxing people and sending your money to Washington to get it back, I mean, we're gonna pay, <laughs> so, so the healthcare industry, this is, this is beautiful, the healthcare industry is gonna pay $8 billion in 2014 to send to Washington to eventually get it back through the exchange because the sub, that money is paid for the subsidies of people that go on the exchange. So we're going to send the money away, we're going to get back, and then we're going to pay for it there. So, so I didn't answer your question, but, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I do think we need to take care, of, take care of people that can't take care of themselves. And if that means, you know, um, the Medicaid expansion, there it seems like there's some money there that we could definitely use. 
uh, to take care of folks, but it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to be more efficient and effective in how we deliver the care, because it's taken over our whole budget. Holly? Well, it's a really, it's a tough one, because it's the balance of the stigma of being on Medicaid, and it really is a stigma, uh, versus being uninsured and, you know, the, the cost of being uninsured. So better to have care from a doctor, you know, that you go to regularly than from the emergency room. But uh, I just think it's a really tough question. It's Gross. an expensive choice. I'm going to give the simple answer, yes, and then I'm going to tell you why I say yes. I think we need a competitive and healthy health market, and um, that includes um, stopping this cross-risk transfer that's going on between different populations. Um, we need to be really, um, we need to consider the risk, the insurance risk that goes with any action or inaction, um, but I also appreciate the, the, the the difficulty the state has in considering that option um, with the questionable funding in the future. Dr. Perry? I'm looking at it from a medical perspective. I see all these patients that are 17 million, I think, in, 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 the, in the U.S. that are going to be now on a, um, a Medicaid-type program. I'm looking at it from a pure, just physician-wise. I mean, there are enough primary care physicians, internists out there to actually support that number. Um, if it does support it, and instead of spending 10, 15 minutes with a patient, you're going to be spending five minutes with a patient because you have so many patients to see. So the delivery of care is going to be lessened. I think the quality of care will actually go down. Um, they've looked at alternatives, um, nurse practitioners. I think that's great, you know, and especially in the urban areas. Um, making medical school, medical school for primary care, making it three years. You know, that might speed a getting uh, primary care physicians out there, but Ultimately, they're going to have to do a residency, and a residency a minimum of three years. So even if the numbers are increased by 17 million tomorrow, it's going to be six years before any physicians get out of medical school. And another and a residency program, another issue is uh, residency programs themselves. Uh, doctors do, they get their MD degree, and then they go through uh, residency training programs, and that's uh, supplemented by the federal government. And now all of a sudden you need uh, an onslaught of more primary care. So you're gonna have to increase the number of residency seats available. Again, that's gonna increase the, the budget regarding taking care of these uh, pa patients that are now on Medicaid or supplement thereof. So I think there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, my, my, my main concern is, is how we're going to actually treat these people. You know, which begs a question. One of the things that we deal with all the time, and I think it, in part it does stifle when we think of innovation or at least that access that you're talking about that's going to be so um, difficult to get our hands around is the, the, the big debate always in Tallahassee is scope of practice. And as we look at these issues as we move forward um, and you look at access issues and, and the ability of people to provide this stuff, I mean, I don't know if you have a general opinion on the scope of practice and without getting into each specific one that comes before us between each group that's fighting, but there does, you know, take just flu shots. I mean, I remember being on staff when flu shots were debated and, and we heard that people were going to be dying walking out of Walgreens and there'd be ambulances, a shortage getting to them, and now we do $2 million. And then another one was that doctors, I think, would, it would be a losing a lot of business for doctors, and, and I don't know the number specifically, so you could correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, we do 2 million flu shots a year. There's not been one adverse incident that at least we know about. And, and from what I understand, talking to my local physicians, is they do more flu shots as a result of all the advertising and walking down the streets. Now when people come in and they're doing something else, they say, hey, can I get a flu shot? And they do more than, not less. But that would be an example of where we have these things, but it was heavily fought and we said, no, we're not gonna do it. Cause and it just seems, especially facing this, this potential massive addition of people um, and the pressures that it will put on physicians, because only physicians can do X, um, that we really ought to take a hard look at where we can expand that um, without sacrificing quality of care. Exactly. I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. I, I believe that, you know, we can make up some ground with nurse practitioners or, you know, um, uh, physician's assistants and assisting in that, uh, but ultimately it's going to be the, the physicians are going to be responsible because nurse practitioners really can't practice without uh, physician supervision. Um, there are some states that will allow nurse practitioners to set up their own practice away from the primary care and supervising physician, which may be something that we, we may want to look at as far as here in Florida. Uh, one of the things that I think when, when people start getting insurance and, and, and getting flu shots, I think it's, it's all preventative medicine. 
and I think that's, that's a big issue that we need to start correcting. Uh, the me medicine, it, it's more reactive than it is proactive. Um, that's the healthcare today. People go in when they're sick, they got chronic diseases. My feeling would be why not take that out of the picture? Why, why wait till they're in you know, end stage renal failure or, or congestive heart failure or a, a brittle diabetic? Why not try to control these people early? Why not get them in, educate them, put them in programs, make sure that that disease, prog the, 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 the progression of that particular disease is stymied, that it's, it's negated. Uh, so you don't have all these continued costs associated with chronic disease. And I think that's, that's a big part of medicine uh, that we're kind of missing. We're trying to hit on it. I know insurance companies are, are trying to give um, uh, benefits, uh, less costs or discounts uh, for preventative type uh, uh, employee, you know, weight loss programs and that sort of thing. Uh, but honestly, I mean, if, if you take the patient in an early stage when they're younger, educate them, you know, what's good, what's not good, exercise, weight loss, diet, whatever is needed to control that disease process, I think it's extremely important. You know what, and I think the cost will, will decrease tremendously if we can do that. You know, we're talking about budget deficits. You know, honestly, you take care of that, it's gonna fix itself. Yeah, really. I, 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 just a comment. I mean, I, you've gotta extend, you know, the provider, the, the, extend the provider uh, support, you know, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I think he who controls, he or she, who controls the risk of the product or the service will influence the behavior. And so what's, what's occurring in today's world is, is obviously your delivery system has been traditionally a volume-based operation. You know, we, we spoke with a particular, um, you know, hospital CEO that says, I implemented a program that reduced uh, readmission and, uh, by 30 percent, but I lost 30 percent of my revenue. So you know, that puts financial pressures on that delivery system. And it's not beneficial to be proactive, to your point, or preventive, uh, and get them in early. Um, so you'll need to have access. Part of the reasons I think telemedicine hasn't taken off is because, you know, we haven't seen a, a nice, and I think we're working towards that, um, but there needs to be, you know, more people probably waiting to see the doctor um, in order to get creative and innovative with some type of solution. And so I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Uh, and I think a lot of health plans are starting to, to really look collaboratively with the delivery systems to say, how can we make this work um, best for everybody? And that's really a solution. Um, you know, as far as the adverse selection with the flu shot, um, I wouldn't agree with that. And I got a personal story, but I won't share it. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Support the Epilepsy Foundation of Florida. I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to go on record as an attorney. I, as much as I, uh, you know, I know, I know Jeff Scott, who's a good friend from the FMA, is in the audience, and so he always reminds me that. So you think paralegal should be doing a lot more of your work? And I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but uh, so I, you know, and and obviously, education matters. You know, expertise matters. Sure. Um, and it, and, and sure. And it is that it is that long term. Uh, one in a million or one that, that, that is worthy of protecting. But um, you should practice at, you know, your peak performance as far as what you should do as a primary or, you know, specialist. Not necessarily some of the other concierge service pieces um, that can be supported in different ways. Um, you know, how much paperwork do you do? Yeah, and that's what I say to Jeff. I yeah. say, well, I mean, are we talking about my paralegal stapling the papers together are we talking right. about, you know? Right, right. right. You know, I agree. And so there's opportunity, especially with technology today, and, and uh, be more efficient and effective. You know, last thing before we take questions from the audience, you know, it, as a lawmaker, and may, maybe I didn't hear everything that was being said, especially some of the stuff you said, Jonathan, but it, it seems a little just, just disheartening to me when I hear that, okay, the innovation that we're looking forward to is really um, people uh, who have assumed some degree of risk, being more creative and, and uh, better at, at managing the care of somebody um, through the delivery process, um, through some sort, and, and then and then utilizing networks so that we can get more people involved in that in that process. It just seems to me that that you know, my first thought is where does that take us in terms of innovation in healthcare and second, other than a better minute, it's basically what, I, what I'm hearing is we, we need better managers, not more creators. And I think what we need is more creators 
Um, and we're doing that with Medicaid reform. I mean, basically what we've done with Medicaid reform is expand to the entire state a level of risk that someone's willing to share, and, there, and, and that same innovation is taking place between um, the, the insurers and the providers in the same regard, where right. now the providers are saying, listen, for us to make money we, in this scenario, we, we need to have, we'll assume some of that risk in order to, um, that you're taking on in order to, and, and we'll help manage and sh shepherd that, that patient. That's all good, but it seems like the, the innovation is we're just going to have a better manager. And the, well, I think you, you obviously need both. I think what's, what's very different today is you have two um, major changes in, in this country. Um, you know, the younger generation, if you look at the percentage of people that have cell phones today, 87% of the people in the country have a cell phone and 54% of those are smartphones. That was like last year. So that will continue to rise. Um, uh, they become more, more, you know, less expensive. People have access. You know, in the future healthcare world, you could possibly give those away, right? As long as I can monitor you and your, you know, diabetes or your congestive heart failure situation, et cetera, and support you. So I think that will come. I mean, it will be taxed 2.3% from a medical advice standpoint. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it will, it, either two things happen. The innovators create that and create efficiency and effectiveness, or they go out of business. And what's happened, I, again, this is a you know, personal opinion from an economic standpoint, is as more regulation has been implemented on banking, insurance, you know, providers, they're aggregating. So you have less choice. And when you have less choice, you have less options and less innovation. Um, so uh, at that point in time, you wonder, is it helping or is it hurting us? at the end of the day. And, and you know, members um, and who, how we compete against other countries, that'll decide that, you know, in the future. Um, but that's, I think, the environment we're in today. Which is, as a, and I, some of the things that we have done in healthcare, you know, where we do a, a consumer-directed care program, I mean, the best person to assume risk with my healthcare is me. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have that, I don't have that ability. Um, yeah. So, so let me give you some, because you really, I mean, if you have a high deductible plan, national statistics are that you are twice as, twice as likely to check either online for the cost of whatever you, you know, you, or procedure you take. And so, you know, with our organization, we have, a, we have, a, uh, we have 11 retail centers, okay, which have served over 130,000 people throughout the state of Florida, Floridians. And when they go in, they can talk to a nurse, they can get a health care risk assessment. They can get connected to um, what we call our, our care compare unit, which will help them compare prices for an MRI or a particular procedure. Um, and on average, uh, they'll, they'll save, you know, $750 or $1,200, depending on that procedure. And at the same time, those individuals will set an appointment for that member to go see them. So, you know, we're looking at different ways to get people access quicker, faster, better, and let them make those choices. Because to your point, if it's your money, you'll think about really what you need. And, um, you know, that's the control I think that you need as a, as a consumer, is where I want to go and what I want to do. Not what you think I should do. Because I might want to get two or three or four different other opinions. I agree. I also want to thank our panelists. Uh their preparation, their insight, it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear. And uh, we hope you uh, continue to enjoy this conference. Thank you very much.